Hey everybody, welcome back. I've got another treat in store for you today. We're going to take a look at another one of the videos from the Microhams Digital Conference last March. This time we're going to hear from Jeffrey Heller, KF7ROU, who's going to show us how he built a magnetic loop antenna controller using OpenWRT. I think you'll enjoy this one. Join me now as we enter Building 37 on the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington. Okay, well thank you. Um, yeah, so today um, I want to talk about this magnetic loop antenna project that I built recently. And, uh, uh, it's something that came up out of uh, experience with trying to get an antenna that would work at my home in this very small yard space that I actually had. And I tried a number of things. I tried a fiberglass pole with a G5 RP Junior on it. I was really not happy with it. It didn't really work very well. It was, I think the G5 RB design is just seems like it's just perpetually out of tune on all bands. Uh, and uh, it also really looked terrible with the big old fiberglass pole and the wind would knock it over periodically. Um, I also built a, um, uh, a gain antenna, which was another fiberglass pole antenna, but it was basically a, 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 a huge pole with two big wires hanging off of it. And uh, it was also getting whipped around in the wind. Uh, and then one of the other things that happened is we had some more neighbors move in next door and they didn't really like all these big things sticking up there. So I had to come up with something else. And uh, I've been looking at this idea of a magnetic loop antenna uh, from a uh, sturdiness and aesthetic standpoint. Uh, and it seemed like it might be ideal. So let's see. So I had a couple of things I wanted to accomplish. One was, yeah, really something that would not stand out. It would be OK in this neighborhood where all the houses are on top of each other. Uh, there's a lot of noise in my area. I live next to a bunch of power lines. So I wanted to make sure that we had pretty good noise rejection. Uh, my personal preference, I like 15 and 20 meter bands. If I could get more, that'd be great. But uh, those are were my minimum. I uh, wanted to have handle 100 watts. I don't plan on using more given how close the houses are to each other. But uh, I should handle at least 100 watts. Uh, I didn't want to run, want to run a whole lot of wire out to it. Uh, there's a, there's a number of designs that I'd seen where you have uh, you know e, like Ethernet cable running outside, and I didn't want to run that. Uh, in fact, I you know I'll talk a little bit about how this could have even been minimized. But um, at, a, at, a, at the most, I wanted a separate 12 volt line to power the the system and then the feed line. Uh, I wanted it modular so I could easily take it apart and modify it. Uh, that was uh, that was a big part of. Uh, the problem I had with some of the other antennas I had built is that there is really no way to, to work on it without taking the entire thing down and uh, taking it out. And since it rains a lot, and oftentimes I would find myself trying to fix this antenna or work on it in the time I have in the evenings after work. So it's in the, I'm in the dark, it's in the, I'm in the rain, I'm outside with a headlamp on, my neighbors are looking out of their windows at me like, what, what are you doing, right? Uh, and I'd like to be able to actually get, get, get out there, quickly take it apart, take it inside, work on it. Uh, wind resistant, as I mentioned, I had a lot of things that were fiberglass pole based, did not do very well, did not hold up for very long. And then finally, it, it really had to be waterproof. Uh, it's just completely uh, drenched in my backyard over the winter. So, so magnetic loop, we talked about a couple of reasons. Uh, one, yep, very small, uh, very small, uh, 0.1 wavelength. Uh, they're known to be very quiet, and I've found that that's very true. Uh, really sturdy. And uh, the other one, which I thought was pretty neat, was it doesn't have to be really high up. So it can be fairly close to the ground and still work very well. And mine ended up being, with the base of the loop, is about seven feet up on mine. Why not a magnetic loop? Well, uh, it's got this extremely narrow bandwidth. So that basically means that no matter what you do, you're going to have to tune it. Right? You're going to have to tune the capacitor. Uh, any tiny change in what frequency you're on requires tuning. Uh, another factor is it requires high voltage. Uh, and uh, that means that you need uh, a high current, high voltage vacuum variable capacitor. That's an expensive part. They're hard to find. Uh, 
new ones are very expensive, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars for something as a new product. Uh, I ended up finding a, a uh, seemingly unused one on eBay, but it was probably built, looked like it was built in 1970s. Uh, so good question as to how long the seals will last. So far it looks okay. Uh, loss resistance. That's a big problem with these magnetic loop designs. And I've seen a number of them, and uh, we'll see in the calculator page here in a minute, that are actually hexagonal in shape. And they've, what they've done is they've soldered together pipe joints instead of actually bending the, uh, uh, the copper. That's, every one of those joints is a potential resistance point. And even, even 0.1 ohm of resistance will significantly impact how effective these antennas are. So you've got to be very careful. And then finally, it's not, it's not really a gain antenna yet. It does have a, a bit of a lobe pattern, but I wouldn't classify this as a gain antenna. Loop calculator. So when I started looking at this idea, I, I did a little bit of looking around at different loop calculators, and there's, there's a lot of stuff available. A lot of it's legacy. Uh, there was a number of Excel spreadsheets you could download that you could work with. Uh, there was, I, I found tools that were written for uh, DOS, right? I had to go find an emulator to be able to run DOS, right? To be able to run them on. Uh, th that was kind of an interesting sidetrack. And, uh, and then I found this, which uh, this turned out to be the most useful. And this is actually a web page, uh, the 66 Pacific.com, had a number of calculators on it. Uh, theirs, not perfect, uh, but these actually did a pretty good job. So I put in my uh, conductor, which was this piece of copper pipe. Uh, that I selected from Home Depot. Uh, I, I just bought the cheapest 10-foot length of copper pipe they had. They had a couple of different grades. I got whatever was cheapest, so $15 for that. It's one inch on diameter, and it's 10 feet long, as I mentioned. Um, I wanted to design around 21.2 uh, megahertz as sort of my center frequency, my design frequency, uh, and uh, 100 watts. So this calculator comes out here with uh, a, a three-foot diameter antenna. Of course, they're talking about a this hexagon design, but it's pretty close for the circular design as well. Plus, I'll be able to get around the, um, the problem of, of loss in the joints. So uh, talk a little bit about fabrication. It's, it's this uh, copper pipe you can get anywhere. Uh, I wanted to actually have a loop and, uh, in the copper pipe instead of soldering it. So I had to build a bending jig and learn how to bend copper, which I'd never done before. That was a bit of an adventure. Uh, this bending jig is the Mark III bending jig. <laughs> right? Mark I and Mark II exploded uh, while trying to bend the pipe. Right? Uh, and uh, just, just FYI, and even this one, you can see the, uh, the wheels sort of partially uh, fell apart while I was doing it. But uh, I was able to actually get this one to work. This is a couple of pieces of uh, plywood uh, that are screwed together uh, for rigidity. Uh, a handle made of some old piece of metal. And uh, the way I made these wheels was using a hole saw. Uh, if anyone else decides to try to do this, try to find some other way to do this than using a hole saw. Uh, I, I literally had, I have three power drills and I would run one until it overheated, right? Take the bit off, stick it on the next one until it overheated, so on and so forth. Uh, it's a really great way to burn out your power drill. However, and this is the Mark II loop. Um, Mark I loop uh, didn't look as nice. But uh, it, it actually worked pretty well. Uh, you end up doing, what you end up doing is running multiple passes through the jig. Uh, one of the things that you can't see in this image, but underneath the center are multiple holes. And uh, that allowed me to get different bend radius. So I'd start out with a minimum bend radius, and then I'd move it to a hole that gave me more bend, and then move it to a hole that gave me more bend. And that's how I was able to get the final bend. Uh, when I get it all done, uh, it's actually more circular than it looks in this photo because this was taken at a bit of an angle. It's fairly circular. Uh, and what I did at the end points there is I clamped them uh, in a vise and then drilled a hole through them for connecting the uh, electrical. So the next piece was the electronics housing. And by electronics, I mean the, uh, uh, the actual vacuum variable capacitor, uh, the motor, the drive shaft control circuit, all the stuff that uh, I wanted to make sure was going to be well protected from the environment. Uh, so a couple of things. So one is uh, I decided to go with large di diameter PVC pipe. I knew it would be easy to seal. It's readily available. 
Uh, this is actually larger than you can get. This is, I believe, a six inch diameter. Larger than you can get at Home Depot. I think they only go to four. So I had to go to a, another a plumbing supply store to get that, but not too hard to get. Uh, I use brass hardware for the loop electrical connections. I have a bit mixed feelings about that because it's going to probably react with the copper pipe at some point, but uh, it seemed like the best option. Uh, I used waterproof DC connectors for power. Uh, so for that, that's a, what I ended up using, I don't know if I have a photo of it, is basically a waterproof automotive style DC connector so that uh, basically the, the the uh, power supply come line runs out of the housing, goes to this disconnect. So I can actually go outside and I can remove the electronics housing completely, disconnect it, take off the, uh, the end connector for the feed line, uh, undo two screws where it's connected to the loop, and uh, I can just take the whole electronics assembly out and repair it or work on it. Uh, and finally, there was a trick to figuring out how to get this electronics unit housed on the, uh, the pole with this PVC pipe that I stood up everything. So what I came up with was, uh, here's, a, here's a picture of the housing. Um, I put some nice stickers on it. That's the um, uh, terminals that are going to go to the loop. Uh, this, this thing was a, this thing right here turned out to be important. I added that later. Uh, so what happened was it started raining when I first got this out, and water was pooling on the top of this thing, shorting it out. So I couldn't actually transmit, and uh, it took a while to figure out what was going on. But uh, what the solution ended up being just sticking some black uh, silicone putty on top so that the water can't pool there between the terminals. Yeah. Uh, this is just a view inside the housing. Uh, I've got a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of extra toroids I've added in here to just try to keep you know, this uh, very high voltage, high frequency environment from coming back down my, my 12 volt supply line into my shack. Uh, and inside here you can see the, um, the strain reliefs and the mounts that uh, are these uh, stainless steel bolts uh, that go through, and I'll show you the other, oh, here's the other side. So this, these are the mounts for the poles, and they're on the other sides of those uh, strain reliefs there. What I've done here is I've got a large stainless bolt head and what you do on the pole is you basically drill a couple of egg-shaped holes uh, so that they're, you know, they're wider at the top now or at the bottom and then you can just go and hang it right on there. It works really well. It's very easy to assemble it and disassemble and it, it's not coming off. Uh, so inside this housing I had what I called the electronics platform and what I came up with was a single piece of HD PE sheet, which I'd worked with before. Uh, it's really interesting stuff. It's basically what they make cutting boards out of. Uh, it's very tough. It's chemical resistant. Uh, no problem with high voltage. And, uh, and important, you can use, you can work it with standard work, woodworking tools. It's also recyclable in case you ever want to recycle this. Uh, oh, and it will hold a screw tap, which a lot of plastics won't. So you can put it, you can get your tap kit out and you can actually put the bolts right into it. Uh, that, that was a big time saver. Another important thing, it, glue does not work, right? You cannot glue anything to this. It comes right off. So this is a view of the electronics platform. And inside here you can kind of get a bit more of an idea of how the build worked. Uh, so again, you've got the cap with the terminals that are going to go to the loop. Uh, you've got the copper wire that runs to the, the actual vacuum variable capacitor. Uh, you have a drive shaft. And over here is the stepper motor. So we'll talk a little bit about the capacitor. Uh, I think I mentioned this earlier. I got a capacitor on eBay. It ended up being a, a Jennings uh, with a 45 kilowatt rating. So that's way higher than I need. Uh, it looks good. I've seen a bunch of these show up on eBay that look like they've been lying around outside for years. Um, this one actually was in pretty good condition. Uh, I suspect, suspect there's somewhere there's some ham that had bought it. And, years ago and had meant to actually build a loop antenna with it and never got around to it. Uh, according to the calculator, I should be able to tune 10, 12, 15, 17, and 20. Uh, in practice, I can only tune 15, 17, and 20. Uh, 10 and 12 seem to, seem to require more capacitance than I actually uh, am able to get on this capacitor. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that the discrepancy is 
probably because the loop diameter is a bit too large to be optimal for those frequencies. I uh, wanted to point out the, uh, the homebrew copper pads, pads, which I came up with for the uh, hose clamps. A lot of folks that are trying to hook up vacuum variable capacitors have a lot of hard times trying to figure out how to actually get the, um, the loop connected. So what I came up with is these hose clamps, and then under here is soft copper, which I basically peeled off of a, uh, of a copper, copper pipe, uh, and, and then I've soldered the actual copper, copper lines to it. So you can you basically tighten the hose clamp, and that clamps this soft copper onto there, and it makes a pretty nice electrical connection. That's another close-up of the um, of the uh, the hose clamp connector. So let's talk about the stepper motor. Uh, I went through about three different stepper motors trying to get this to work. One of the stepper motors I tried was say uh, I tried a NEMA 17. I tried a NEMA 23. And uh, the NEMA 17 wasn't strong enough. Um, the 23 was really quite large, and I wasn't very happy with that. Uh, and then I ran into this on eBay, which is a, a NEMA 17 with a planetary reduction gear. Uh, I felt that this really was an ideal solution. So it allows me to use a lot smaller motor. Uh, you've got quite a bit of torque with the planetary reduction gear. And then something that we'll talk about a little bit later is backlash, which is if I, if I remove the power from the motor, you don't want the twist in the drive shaft to reposition the motor position, right? Because that'll result in, accur in inaccuracies when you go to tune it later. So drive shaft. Uh, of course, the, uh, the capacitor, including the tuning uh, uh, knob, is all at high voltage, which could be as much as 10,000 volts. The calculators talk about average voltages uh, but uh, from what I've read about these things, while you're transmitting, depending on what you're doing, it can get up to 10K. That's, that's up there. So I want this uh, low voltage microcontroller on the right to be pretty far away from what I've got here on the left. Uh, I came up with this uh, acetyl palm drive shaft. I did a little bit of looking around at what kind of plastics to use. And I wanted something that had a high degree of stiffness. Again, I'm trying to avoid backlash uh, in the system and, and keep the precision high wanted to not have to worry about having perfect alignment. So I found these aluminum flex couplings, which are pretty nice. And they don't actually seem to have a lot of spring to them. They seem to actually perform their function pretty well. So they were something that you can, that's readily available. And you can get them in 8 millimeter sizes uh, already set up so that you can hook them right on. The motor, the stepper motor, is driven by this A4988 um, Palulu compatible. I don't know what Palulu is. It's some, something that uh, the rep rap guys are into. Uh, but uh, uh, you can get these very inexpensively. They're two bucks. Um, that's that's a, a bit misleading. I had to buy about 10 of them because I burned out a whole bunch of them learning what not to do with these things. Uh, <laughs> but uh, a couple of things to, to point out. Um, that capacitor, that matters. <laughs> not, not really optional. It turns out the motor. Uh, can feed back about about 30 volts uh, back into the uh, into the device, so the capacitor is there to keep the motor from feeding back into the uh, into the motor controller. Uh, other things, don't use your fluke multimeter to trace pathways to try to figure out where circuits are broken because whatever voltage is the fluke, fluke multimeter is using for uh, determining resistance is too high and will just burn out this board. So uh, burned out a bunch of them. Uh, 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 that way. Uh, and finally, the other thing which I, which I found out is this logic power supply needs to be the same voltage as your control signals. Uh, if you don't, you don't, it does not work. So if you feed it 5 volts, it will very happily not do anything. OK, the rat's nest. Uh, this is what the actual, the actual electronics assembly looks like. Uh, yeah, not super pretty. Uh, I decided to make it pretty by putting a cover on it. When I was done, and uh, right here you've got the incoming power. So this is the 12 volt supply. Uh, underneath this terminal block, which you can't see uh, very well, is a, uh, a a DC to DC converter that takes the incoming 12 volts and converts it to five. Uh, that so that DC to DC converter then is connected to this micro USB uh, input, and then in here we've got the TP-Link WR703N which I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Uh, this 
particular 703N has had a rough life. Uh, I've, uh, while prying the case open, I jammed the screwdriver into the circuit board and knocked off a bunch of the, um, the pull-up pull -up resistors. Uh, interestingly, that had no effect. I later found out online that there's, uh, on the OpenRT, WRT project, a bunch of the, uh, the folks that have torn this down and, and documented the schematic have pointed out that this particular model chip has built in pull-up resistors, so they didn't even need to have those pull-ups on the outside. So that's probably why it didn't matter. Um, I've also torn traces off of here. This is actually GPIO uh, 29. Uh, the trace is ripped, and I uh, managed to solder it back on, and then I just glued it in place with some silicone so that it uh, hopefully won't pull out again. So, so yeah, despite all that, it actually works really pretty well. Uh, a couple of other modifications. Uh, this external antenna that was just borrowed off of an old access point, uh, and there's instructions you can find online for adding an external antenna to this to this unit. Uh, these are actually a pretty fun little unit to play with. They're very inexpensive, uh, the, the TLWR703N. Uh, you can get them for about 20 bucks, $22 on eBay. Uh, and I've had a number of people ask me why not, why not just use a Raspberry Pi? Well, uh, I, I wanted it to be inexpensive, and the Raspberry Pi is actually more than I need. Raspberry Pi has got you know, HDMI outs and a bunch of other functionality and 512 megs of RAM. You don't need all that to just control a motor. And, this whole unit, including the power supply, and it's, oh, it's got a case on it, which you also don't get with a Raspberry Pi, uh, is uh, $22 shipped to your house. So this is the actual circuit board out of the WR703N, and this is just giving you a quick idea of how this is wired. It's pretty, pretty simple wiring. Uh, you've got your two GPIOs. These are the three uh, resistors that I knocked off with my screwdriver one time. Uh, you don't need them. Uh, you can wire directly to these pads. GPIO 7 and GPIO 29 are available uh, and easy to get to. Uh, and I use those to control the step input and the direction input on the A4988. Uh, the 3.3 volts I mentioned, you need that for your logic supply. And that's available on this unused LED2 pin. They never put an LED on it anyways, and it's got a very nice stable 3.3 volt. And your negative is easy to get to, your ground is easy to get to as well. A um, couple other things that are optional on this. Um, so on the 4988, what I do is if you, if you leave enable uh, 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 unconnected, it basically stays enabled. That's pretty much what I do. Uh, so the motor is always active whenever the device is on. MS1, MS2, and MS3 control uh, how far to step per turn. If you don't connect them, it'll do the minimum. That's also what I wanted because I wanted higher precision and lower speed. So, so by default, you can leave all those unconnected. Uh, this is, I'm not expecting anyone to be able to read this, but the, um, the basic programming language that comes on the 703N is Lua, which I don't know if anyone's run into that. Super rudimentary scripting language, even more rudimentary than Bash. Uh, but it does work, and it doesn't require loading anything else, and you can actually uh, debug in real time while you're, while you're working on it. So, and this actually is the part of my control script by the way, I'll make this the full script available to anyone who's interested. Uh, but this is the part of the control script that actually has the code that pulses the motor, right? And there's some timing on here that uh, I determined experimentally. One of the tricks with uh, Lua on this device is um, there, if you want to do any timing, you need a sleep function. And there isn't a sleep function in Lua on that device, except there is one in the socket library. So if you go to the socket library, you can use the sleep function out of there. Uh, and that works out pretty well. So let's talk a little bit about the feed line. Uh, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have a feed line that I didn't have to disconnect to, to work on the, uh, on, on the uh, uh, electronics. And I wanted it to actually be fairly clean looking. So I came up with the idea of running the feed line up the support pole, having the toroid uh, coupling transformer at the top of the pole, and then uh, that would allow me to, to basically thread the loop through there. You can just kind of imagine uh, uh, just spinning it around. You can get the, the gap in the loop through the hole, spin it around, and you can hook it on there very easily. So you can basically remove the whole antenna without ever touching the feed line, right, or the coupling transformer. Uh, there are a couple of other ways that you can feed a magnetic loop antenna. Uh, there's the unshielded coupling loop, which is basically a, a smaller loop inside the, the larger loop. 
there's a shielded coupling loop that's called the Faraday, people call it the Faraday loop, and uh, which is very similar except for using just basically a piece of shielded coax. Uh, there is gamma match, uh, which I looked at and looked like it would require a lot of fiddling around with to get it to work well. And then there's the ferrite coupling transformer. Uh, I gravitated, tra gravitated towards this. It just looked like it had the least amount of tuning required, and uh, you could set it up once and not have to worry about adjusting it. And that was really what I was looking for. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in looking at these different coupling methods, there's a great website, this Nonstop Systems uh, website has a, a lot of information on these different coupling techniques. So back to 66 Pacific. Uh, the coupling calculator they have for the magnetic loop uh, is interesting information. It's not exactly right either, but uh, it was close. I tried probably four different coupling calculators, including you know one from one from, one from Dosland. The Dosland one was by far the most wrong, telling me that I needed 11, 11 turns on the uh, uh, on the uh, Amidon core, which was nowhere close to what it actually needed. Uh, this was the closest of all the calculators, saying that I needed four. Uh, in reality, it worked best with three. Uh, here's what the what the uh, coupling looks like. So then this is an end connector, uh, which goes to the feed line. This is just a little piece of uh, sign plastic, uh, quarter inch sign plastic, which I've drilled some holes in for uh, um, for strain relief. I went a little overboard. The uh, the wire I ended up using is a 12 gauge silver plated Teflon coated aircraft wire. Uh, a lot of the guys online talk about it. I, I suspect that this is like speaker cables, right? And, uh, and that you could have just used copper. But anyways, I had some. And uh, uh, it, it looks nice. And I'm hoping it is at least weather, you know, it's not going to get too beat up by the weather since it is exposed. Uh, anyways, that's the Amidon core. Uh, this is a core that's been around for a number of years, this FD24061. It's got enough room to pass a one inch copper pipe even after it's been wrapped. And uh, so that's important. You've got to have enough spacing. And uh, this was one of my earlier attempts. And this was the one based on the, the this is one of the versions based on the DOS software. And uh, uh, definitely not the right number of windings. So as I mentioned before, I final version ended up being three windings. So this is a chart I made up to try and understand what the calibration of this whole system would be. So what I've done here is I've gone and I've First off, in the software, I've, I've picked an arbitrary starting point, an arbitrary integer for the counting the number of steps that have been fed into the, into the motor. And each time I increment it, I add to that number. And each time I decrement it, I subtract from that number. It's very, very simple. And every time the system completes moving, uh, it records the new number out of the file, and I reuse the file. Uh, and as long as you don't lose power while it's moving, uh, you won't lose where you are. Uh, and the result is this. And one of the things that I thought was kind of surprising about this was just how linear this seemed, although I don't really have a whole lot of data uh, in the midpoints. But uh, I, was, I was expecting more of a curve here than I got. Uh, and it, it does look fairly linear. I need to do a little bit more samples, though, to really understand what the, what the, formula, what the formula looks like. So the loop intended practice. So currently what I do is I have a, a coax switch in my, in my, in my shack that I use to switch between the SWR analyzer and the radio. Um, so when I start a session, I power on the, uh, I send the, start the power up 12 volts over to the, uh, 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 to the WR703N. And uh, I will verify that the SWR is where I expected it to be, given the last tuning parameters, last tuning that I did. Uh, I have noticed there is some variability. I think this has to do with how much it's raining outside. Uh, actually affects the reflectivity of the ground and changes the way the antenna behaves slightly. It's not usually off by much, though. It's usually pretty, pretty reliable. Uh, so then I log into the 703N, and I'm, right now I'm just using SSH, and I'm executing Lewis scripts. I've written a bunch of presets that you know, I can use to say if I want to tune to 14070 uh, uh, megahertz uh, so I can, I can uh, um, send some messages. Then I can just preset to that, and it'll go right to it. Uh, one of the things that's been nice about this is it's it's really pretty consistent. I've not had a lot of problems with that. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have limit switches to determine how far you? No, that's a great idea. Yes, <laughs> we can talk about that. Yeah, so um, definitely uh, works pretty well. I've had some pretty great contacts. 
like immediately. Uh, first contact was 30 watts uh, and uh, with MF MSK. Got a great report with that. Uh, and then just uh, about a month ago, I was just, uh, uh, I thought I'd try to hit Puerto Rico. I heard this guy talking, it was coming in really clear, and he said that uh, there was no problem understanding me. And so I, I figured, well, I'm talking to Puerto Rico on my little, my little hoop here in my backyard and uh, a really no big deal antenna. So it's not really, uh, not, not a bad solution at all. I'm, I'm pretty happy with how it turned out. So future work. Definitely one of the things to think about are limit switches. Uh, there is nothing to stop this right now. Uh, I did not put on any limit switches because I didn't have any easy way to get access to additional GPIO ports on the, uh, the WR703. Uh, the other, there are more GPIO ports. They're harder to solder on, right? Uh, and uh, that was one of the main reasons why I didn't, I didn't come up with that. Uh, the other reason was on the particular uh, capacitor that I had, there wasn't really an obvious way to put in limit switches that I could see uh, because it's multiple turns. And so I can't just put, say, a, a, a little, uh, little plastic rod on the drive shaft and say, well, once it turns here, it should hit a switch and turn it off. You can't do that. It's got to turn a whole bunch of times. So then the next thing is, well, you've got to put on uh, something that measures how far in and out the plunger is gone, right? And you, need, you could potentially do a limit switch like that with maybe putting a, um, a, a couple of, uh, some kind of plastic washer on the drive shaft and, uh, and a switch that's connected to the washer. And that, as that drive shaft moves ever so slightly in and out, that washer could hit a switch that, uh, uh, that, that, uh, 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 that triggers, the, triggers it to stop. Uh, I, I think that I may not end up actually doing that because I have not had any problems at all with it, uh, you know, going out of control. You, know, you do have to think about, well, if you send it a, if I send it a, you know, erroneously send it a command to go to a position that is way out of range, uh, it could do that. But I could also put in software limits to stop that from happening as well. There's, uh, yeah, there's definitely, a, I, I think, an improved version of this, something that uh, if you wanted to have uh, uh, be available for for the larger, the larger public to use, you definitely want to have limit switches because you can definitely break your capacitor with this the way it's currently built. Uh, I had a couple of other ideas for things to, to improve this. So you saw the, the graph that I made. Um, I would like to figure out a little bit more of the, uh, 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 do a little bit more samples along that graph and then try to figure out what exact formula is needed to actually uh, uh, compute the the, uh, um, the stepper position from the frequency. I mean, it looks linear on that chart, but that chart has a lot of gaps in it. So it could be nonlinear in those areas that have the gaps. Uh, another idea uh, that was mentioned to me, I thought this was cool. Um, take the CIV output. I've got an ICOM 7000. So take the CIV output from that. Um, just get another WR703N. And uh, this one would basically listen to the CIV output and then it would use this formula to figure out how to automatically tune the capacitor. So you don't actually have to execute a script at all. It will just track what you do. Can, in the glass, uh, in case of that, can you see the plunger? You can. So you're thinking maybe use a, uh, uh, some kind of like an infrared sensor. Yeah, what if you had that? something with, uh, would see a light beam, and if it broke the, Possibly. the beam, you'd do your stop. Yeah, it's possible. It's. Uh, it's not a really ideal environment for a light beam because they are looking through some wavy glass and uh, all the parts inside are shiny. Yeah. But uh, it, it, uh, uh, it might be possible. Uh, okay, okay, a couple other things. Um, definitely thought about, you know, it'd be cool to have a web GUI that had information on here's the motor position, maybe have some buttons, uh, some presets where I can just click on a web page and tell it to go instead of using a shell script. Uh, another item that I thought of was, um, this motor capacitor backlash bothers me a bit, and there's a couple of ways to look at this. So uh, just, make, just I want to make sure everyone understands what I'm talking about when I talk about this backlash. The, um, the motor is, as the motor is turning the capacitor, this capacitor has a lot of resistance, and that drive shaft and those flex couplings are all twisting as a spring load before the actual capacitor starts to turn. If I take the, uh, if I take the force off of the motor, say I cut the power, right, then the motor might turn back slightly. But also, if I change directions with the motor, it's not going to change directions immediately. It's going to have to uncoil that spring and then recoil it in the opposite direction. There's a couple of things you can do about this kind of backlash. Uh, one of them is uh, 
you can make sure that you always approach a, a frequency setting from the same direction. Uh, so meaning if you, you, you know, pick a direction and say you always come from the positive direction. So if you want to tune down, you'd actually have to go down, shoot past where you want to go, and then come back up so you're shooting from the positive direction. That's going to give you better repeatability for your stepper motor uh, direction changes. Uh, another thing to think about is before you power off, you might want to release the tension on, on the spring load so that it doesn't move the motor. Uh, so that's another thing you can do is, as an improvement is uh, uh, figure out if you measure how far the backlash is, then figure out uh, before you power off, execute a command to move halfway across the backlash so that the spring load's not still on the motor. And when you turn it off, it doesn't actually move the motor, losing the, the exact position it's currently in. Uh, and then finally, um, I'm, I'm definitely seeing some, some changes from weather conditions. I suspect that they're the same changes every time, and uh, that there might be a way I could build a, you know, a, a uh, rain button that automatically puts in the compensation for rain. So yeah, definitely a lot of areas for improvement. Uh, what you're seeing at the software right now is really primitive. It's just uh, the result of having really just gotten the, uh, the build done uh, a couple of months ago and haven't really had that much time to work on the software yet. So that's it. Questions? So what if you didn't have limitations for your antennas there, but you wanted to use this simply as a low noise receiving antenna? Did you analyze it, uh, how simple it would be or <coughs> difficult, how complicated it would be to simply use it, uh, a remote controlled tuning for just simply using it as a receive antenna for low noise? I did not, I did not go through that. I think that uh, if you were receiving only, uh, I think that you would, you would be able to use a really low voltage capacitor, right? And so you, you might be able to come up with some, some other sneaks that, uh, that you can't do with, with transmit capability. Uh, you might be able to use a, um, I'm actually thinking of something like a, uh, a, a, a capacitor network, a switched capacitor network, so you don't actually have to tune anything at all. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Right. But in that case, take your beautiful design because it's really cool and use the stepping motor for position. Sure. Yeah, and I've definitely seen. I've seen some folks that have designed loops that have the that that rotate. Um, if I rotate mine, it'll be pointing right in my neighbor's house, and uh, so I thought I'm probably not going to do that. But um, but uh, yeah, there's definitely uh, 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 once you once you go receive only, there's a lot of a lot of things you can do differently that'd be a lot less expensive. Other questions, yeah. Kurt. Uh, Kurt WR5J. I I, in, I built one of the octagonal ones. I fully, oh, right, yeah. fully concur with the observation. The couplings are lossy and then not a good idea. And one idea that is good is uh, some. I just picked up some hardline um, seven eighths. Okay. That's copper. Can supposedly copper continuous right. yeah. and easy to bend. So that gets you past all of that all that stuff. And right. uh, well, okay. <laughs> well, no, it's already bent. Seven eighths easy to bend doesn't normally go together. So anyway. And I've, so I've actually seen some, uh, uh, you know, you go to the plumbing shops and you can get a, a soft copper large diameter pipe. Uh, it's very expensive though, I mean, by the foot. Yep, you know, that's you're, what you're, I, you're gonna so pay that's, like that's 20, what I started 20 out bucks a foot. It's much thicker than you need, but it's very soft copper and it comes on a roll so you could, I can imagine you could just kind of stretch it out a little bit and you're gonna get your, your circular shape without having to fight with it a whole lot. Also, just one piece to add is that uh, I started out with um, braid from coax as my connection between the uh, capacitor and oh, my yeah, loop. Oh, yeah, 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 Don't go there, it's lossy, it's another problem. Okay. Use, use as broad uh, strips of copper as you can, can like solder to the pieces. Your soft copper thing looked like a really good solution. Javier, KG7ELE. I'm just wondering, the radiating pattern of your uh, magnetic loop as well as your total cost of the antenna itself? Uh, well, the, uh, the radiating pattern, it's, uh, they all radiate a kind of a figure eight, and, uh, and that's along the axis of the, of the antenna itself. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, if, you had the, if you had the loop you know, aimed this way, then your radiation pattern would be equally in both directions this way, right? Uh, 
oddly, I, I, I always thought that, you know, just looking at it, that it would radiate, you know, through the center of loop, but it doesn't, right? That's not its, its major area. That said, it's not, it's not at all a gain antenna. Its radiation pattern is, you know, I think fairly figure eight-ish, but not, it's, I think uh, the gain is something like 2.1 decibels. It's pretty low. Uh, total cost, I hadn't really thought about that. Um, I was lucky and I found that capacitor for about 80 bucks. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I had to buy more than once. Uh, and uh, so I ended up with, you know, two copper pipes. But, uh, you know, to make the two different versions of the loop, uh, the first version, which had some nicks in it, and uh, uh, some nice person at Amazon uh, decided to buy it for me, right, uh, for the price of the copper. And, uh, uh, you know, the PVC pipe, the, the end caps on the PVC pipe it cost $15. I don't know why PVC pipe end caps cost $15. That, that seemed pretty crazy to me. Uh, the, uh, because they can. Because they can, exactly. Uh, so, but most of the parts were Home Depot. Uh, the couple of things, the, uh, I, like I said, I ended up buying three motors to figure out which motor would work the best. So I've got a bunch of extra motors. So I don't know if we include those in the cost, uh, cost analysis. Uh, the motor that I ended up with cost about 40 bucks. Um, I think you can get them a bit cheaper, uh, but uh, I've been pretty happy with it, and especially as, as, as I mentioned, it's the planetary gear doesn't seem to have any backlash at all. It's very hard to turn it. So I can, I can really I can cut the power, and it will sit there under tension until I turn it back on again. And, uh, and that, that's actually a pretty nice, nice result, so I don't have to worry about it un untwisting after I cut the power to it. Um, I don't know. I would guess that probably the total build was probably $250 or so, uh, including all up. Yeah. Jeffrey, uh, yours is a elegant technological solution to a political problem, <laughs> uh, which is discrimination <laughs> against radio amateurs in terms of uh, uh, where we live uh, because of our antennas. We now, for the second year, have a bill in Congress. It's uh, HR 1301, if you want to write that down, HR 1301. If you go to the ARRL website, there's a great letter by Kay Craigie, the ARRL president, giving suggestions about how to effectively talk to your member of Congress. Last time around, not a single uh, representative from the state of Washington co-sponsored the legislation. We, we should make that completely different and try to get all Washington state uh, members of Congress to uh, co-sponsor H.R. 1301. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.